afternoon, everyone. We hope everyone is having an amazing day. We want to welcome you all to the University of Houston Downtown Implicit Bias Center with your citywide effort to address implicit bias for school discipline reform. With us, we have the talented and the wonderful Dr. Jerry Wallace and Dr. Jonathan Schwartz from UHD College of Public Service. And we have a couple of questions that we'll be asking them. And in addition to that, we will also open it up to the audience for you all to send in your questions virtually that you all would like to have them answer. If you can, please send in your questions through the chat or you can send Desiree Rios an email at Desiree.Rios at HoustonTexas.gov. So John and Jerry, how are you two feeling this afternoon? Feeling great. I'm feeling awesome, how are you? <laughs> That's awesome, I'm doing good, thank you. So we will jump right in to be cognizant of everyone's time. So the first question we have for you all is that, how did you two decide to collaborate on the Implicit Bias Center? So maybe I'll start giving a little history of kind of how this started and you can jump in. Sure. Uh, so, uh, I wrote a grant with my colleague, uh, Dr. Nikki Coleman, uh, who's now at MD Anderson as the diversity officer, uh, maybe two or three years ago to look at how we could address, we're both psychologists, and how we could address police racial bias. And we obtained the grant and it led to a project where we started really delving into work with neuropsychologists and police trainers and police captains community uh, advocates and really looked at how to address racial bias and started kind of thinking about what's behind it, what's behind implicit bias, what's the latest research, and how that could make a difference in training police officers. And as we were doing that project, I started thinking a lot about colleges of education and colleges that have teacher education at the University of Houston downtown and how implicit bias may impact teachers in the classroom with students. So from that, uh, when I came over to UHD as dean in July, I started working uh, luckily with Dr. Wallace and we started talking about what we could do at UHD to start addressing this issue. And uh, Christy Rangel, who's not on camera, has been a partner in a lot of the work I've done. So we were able to connect around the citywide effort. Uh, and we'll get into kind of, I guess, what the center does as we go on. But that's kind of what started it. I agree with everything he said. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to piggyback on some of the thoughts, um, here at UH Downtown, specifically at our college, uh, we have a majority of the students of color at our institution. Um, so you have a uh, Hispanic population that's roughly about 48%, the African American population that's between 21 and 23%. So you have these students who are, of course, commuter students. Uh, we don't have residential housing here. Uh, we're located in the urban community, of course, uh, in the downtown area of Houston. So you have a lot of areas nearby, near north side, uh, east end, fifth ward, who are, have been traditionally low socioeconomic uh, minority communities. Uh, so we want to provide them opportunities to enroll in our institution, to have great quality of faculty instruction, and to move through degrees, bachelors, and master's degrees. But we also understand that as these first generation students transition through, uh, those may be out of high school or transfer students, um, they also come with uh, challenges and concerns uh, from their own personal and cultural backgrounds. So as an institution, we often talk about in higher education of how do we create uh, safe spaces for students? How do we put ourselves and inform ourselves to be more cognizant of uh, challenges that they face? Um, and some of it is reflection of self, right? Uh, even though we earned our credentials and we moved down in different spaces, we also have to be mindful that we are here for the students and we're here for our community so we can impact them. And uh, that is a big piece of what we want to hope. Uh, we hope that this center is able to do. That's awesome. And that perfectly aligns as to why there is a focus on implicit bias because when it comes overall to the um, population, for the college, like how you mentioned before, is predominantly a large population of students of color. And overall, when you were mentioning the reflection of self, that's so important, especially for implicit bias, like how we all had the opportunity to sit in on the training with Dr. Re Reverend Dr. Brian T. Marks and how he talked about how it really is that unconscious decision that we do end up making and how in order to address it, we do have to have a reflection of self. 
Great. In addition to that, um, what is the vision that you all have for the center? Uh, do you want me to jump in? Uh, I'll, let me talk a little bit about implicit bias. Okay. And just for people who may not be as familiar with it, uh, and why we're kind of excited about that as a construct. Uh, so implicit bias is really your schema about things, so how you think about things. And I think like a good example I've heard is if you had a teacher and a principal walk into a classroom, since we're talking about education a lot today, so you have a teacher and a principal, you just hear the word teacher and principal, you have some ideas of what that person is going to be about. So you have some preconceived notions of how they're going to behave in the classroom, what characteristics you think they might have. And some of that will be like how you felt about your own teachers, how your what you've seen on TV and the media about teachers and principals, all that's going to go into your schema and how you think about teachers. And that's really what implicit bias is. So we're often unaware of where those schemas come from. So when you talk about like racial implicit bias, someone sees someone who's African American, they may have already have some biases. They will have some biases from their own experiences, from the media, from from even racist things they've heard that they may not be conscious of. So what research really shows is that impacts every part of life. So when we talk about like um, implicit bias center, you often talk about structural racism and institutional racism and underlying structural institutional racism is individual implicit bias. So when someone applies for a job, their, their stereotypes that someone may not be aware they have are gonna come up how they look at that applicant. Or when someone has a student in the classroom, those will come out and who they call on in the classroom, how they uh, punish someone for bad behavior in the classroom. Their expectations for that person's uh, performance in the classroom all comes out. That's all parts of the list bias. So we're excited here because at the Co College of Public Service, we have education, we have criminal justice, and we have social work. We actually have a police academy, the biggest one in Texas within our college. So we thought, where better to really start studying and trying to make a difference in this issue than at University of Houston downtown at the College of Public Service. So our real vision for the center is intervention. So assessment, intervention, and research. And trying to change implicit bias, which then changes behavior. Do you have anything that you would like to add? I think he answered that question. Yeah. Awesome. Great. So I know that you mentioned that when it comes to the overall vision for the Implicit Bias Center, how it's really going to be focused on the assessment and the intervention. Um, through that, what type of data and or information will the Implicit Bias Center be collecting specifically aligned to the vision that you all have for the center? So a big piece of it, again, is, is involving faculty, uh, utilizing our faculty and their expertise utilizing also students, allowing students to engage in the process because at the end of it, you're trying to create opportunities for students to understand and recognize their own implicit bias as they go into the classroom. So you may have students who are a part of the research, whether they are participants or subjects in the research, uh, but you also, again, we have graduate programs here in our teacher education areas. So we allow uh, for students to be a part of our ACE program, which allows them to get community engagement uh, hours as they support our, our areas. That's important. Also having an opportunity to bring in experts from around the country uh, who can bring in uh, their information to support our community and our development. Uh, but a big piece of it, again, uh, is assessing ourselves, right? How do we look at our faculty? How do we look at our staff who are engaged in this process? Because the university at large, how do we look at uh, different spaces within our institution that are student support initiatives or student success programs and centers how do we assess those programs? Um, how do we send out surveys that we can go back and review, we can come up with data, we can go back and ask questions again, uh, both quantitative and qualitative, right? Um, how does it impact enrollment? All of these things uh, can lead to how we begin to evaluate ourselves first within our college before we go out and you know try to express or try to change or in, in, you know uh, move things around at large. You start small, right? You start with, with, with a pool or with a group of participants, and then you continue to evaluate as you move forward. Do you have anything that you would like to add, John? I think that was well said. I think the only thing, I mean, I think just to emphasize, 
think whenever you do this kind of work, you first want to look at yourself. So we want to do that as a faculty and a staff, look at our own implicit bias and how that affects our everyday interactions. Uh, we really want to practice what we preach. And then our kind of first target for intervention is student teachers. And we, we are interested in collecting data on people's level of implicit bias, but we're, we're most interested in looking at how that impacts their behavior in the classroom and how we're able to change that and have more. Like one of the things we talk about kind of as our mission is disrupting inequality. And, uh, and that, so we want to do things that really move the needle on people's behavior to create more equal environments in education and criminal justice and social work. I think that's fantastic. And like how you all mentioned, it will be a little incremental approach that you all will be taking, but it's just so important that you all are taking that time to really step back and look at the faculty that you all have and looking at the goals and like how you mentioned, being able to assess yourselves before moving forward and moving forward with this work when it comes to the community and the students that are interacting with the college. So that's fantastic. The next question that we have for you all is that um, how will the information and your resources that you all will be collecting through the implicit bias study be able to benefit students on campus and overall to keep safe the community as you all go throughout that incremental approach? Well, I think again, it just kind of piggybacks on the last portion of your, of your first question is that as we move uh, to develop within, you know, creating opportunities we can then take this and we become an influential for our community. We can start to host institutes or program research within our college. Uh, we can engage uh, diverse spaces and become a hub within the college itself to where the community and various agencies can come to us and say, hey, how do we begin to support implicit bias within our workplace? How do we begin to impact change within our school districts, within our ISD, which was K-12? How do we support uh, students and adults continuing education, right? Those different spaces. So um, as we move forward, we again assess, and most importantly, our faculty now become aware, right? Of how do we bring in individuals uh, who can continue to support and develop uh, who we will become? But again, it goes back to our faculty. I think our faculty are great, and I think that they bring their own set of skill set uh, to the center. Um, we will continue just to move forward and connect. Yeah, no, Dad, I heard, I just saw someone broke that they're having a little trouble hearing. So we're going to try and uh, move the volume up a little little bit and talk louder. Uh, so we'll try that. Let us know that if that works, people. I hope other people can hear. Uh, and our hope eventually, kind of to piggyback on what Dr. Wallace was saying, our hope eventually is to become an asset for the community. So I'm really excited that we're partnered with the city. Uh, because I feel like that can bring the message about implicit bias up to lots of different segments of the population. And we want to be a place, I've uh, had some conversations with uh, our partners around criminal justice and education, and implicit bias is a conversation a lot of people are having. So, uh, so I really hope we can be an asset, we can be a service to people who want to start looking at implicit bias in their organization and we can help them. And that perfectly aligns with the type of work that our work groups are going about right now, which is having um, representatives from all different types of organizations and companies who identify the need that is needed when it comes to addressing, addressing implicit bias within the respective fields and coming together to figure out a way of how to move forward. So as you all go throughout this incremental approach of being of service to the community by assessing yourselves and reflecting, how do you all plan on supporting um, the work groups? Can, and just as a quick question, can people hear us a little better now? Has this made a difference? Oh, good, good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I think what we can do, uh, you know, the work groups are still forming and, and we're still starting to meet, but I think what we can do is be, uh, be a service of research arm of that. So as people have ideas they want to do in the community, as people want to do larger trainings, we can really help people with the assessment individually of implicit bias and then looking at as researchers how that makes a difference over time. So I hope we can be thought partners with the expertise we have in our college because we have 
Uh, Dr. Wallace and I are at Cameron today, but we have a number of faculty who have expertise in this area who are on a group with us forming our center. Uh, but I hope we can be thought partners in bringing that expertise, but also be research partners as a university. Do you have anything you'd like to add, Jerry? Just to echo what he said, um, you, don't, you don't take on these types of initiatives by yourself. Uh, collaborative effort, partnering with the city, partnering with general faculty within and other community agencies that we, we know will come on board. Um, when you want to impact the city, you start small, but you start with a vision, you start with a plan, but you also start with the right people at the table. Uh, so again, forming those work groups, um, having great discussion, but also putting you know, a plan of action. That's, that's the most important thing because you know, quite often in these spaces, we, we, we talk, we have ideas, we have expectations, but how do we put things forward and begin to put dates, timelines, expectations, and things, and then incrementally start to see change. Um, so we have all those things that we're working through, and uh, Dr. Schwartz has great ideas on what we, we're going to move forward, so we're excited about it. Awesome. We're so excited and really thankful to have you all on board when it comes to this effort that we're going about, especially as just like having you all as research partners and as thought partners that will continue to make our coalition strong and will continue to have impactful changes as we go about the process of the work groups meeting together and leading to those requests for proposals at the end. So we're really grateful to have you all. See that we're getting a lot of questions in the, um, in the group chat, so we'll ask you all two more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience just to make sure that everyone's questions are being answered. So the, um, the last couple of questions that we have, um, they're individual for both, for both of you. So for you, John, overall, how are we seeing this issue of implicit bias manifest in how we serve the university? I think, I mean, in so many ways. I mean, it, it's when you talk about implicit bias, it's really how you think about things. So it's your cognitions about lots of things. So people have implicit bias about people who are elderly, about people who are overweight. Uh, there's implicit bias is a big part of our whole life. It becomes a barrier when the people who have empowered make decisions are unaware of the implicit bias. So that's if we were going to kind of drive one point home, I think that would be the point that unawareness of implicit bias, especially higher levels of implicit bias, is dangerous if you empower those people. And so we want to use interventions. We want people to understand implicit bias, what their personal implicit bias is, and then use interventions to reduce that, especially with people who are working directly with people who think they're uh, So I feel like almost anything you name can be impacted by implicit bias. If I'm teaching a university class and I have expectations about someone's performance based on their race or gender, which is natural because we all have implicit bias, and I understand those things, and I'm unaware of my implicit bias, it's gonna come out the way I'm great. It's gonna come out who I choose to accept as a student. So it, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I can't stress enough the importance of that as something to look at in every part of what we do in the city of Houston and beyond. Definitely, I completely agree, because like how we even learned from the training within Reverend Dr. Mm -hmm. Ryan T. Mars, how even good people can yeah. have it. Um, implicit bias and through the implicit bias how a lot of times one may be thinking that they're helping someone when really they're harming someone so it's just so important to be able to take that moment to be able to reflect and look and just look at different ways of how we need to address the all the bias that we have within ourselves and that's what's powerful to me i mean among other things is that when people who are watching and want to want to do i know someone was talking about wanting to do implicit bias training in their organization it you can do it in a way that doesn't accuse someone of being a bad person. Yeah. So like some people who are overtly racist are bad. People, everyone on this earth has implicit bias, but unchecked implicit bias leads to bad behavior. Yeah. So, so I think it's a great thing in organizations. I think every organization should be talking about this issue as a way that not accusing someone, but as a way to say, you need to be aware of this or you're going to do damage. The last question we have for you, Jerry, is that given your background with Men of Legacy, and definitely feel free to touch upon that for our audience as well, how will the center help to address the issues that super minorities face, especially regarding trauma and mental health? 
Well, my background with the Middle Legacy Program is uh, it was created in an effort to increase enrollment for men of color in New Age downtown. Um, I had an opportunity to collaborate uh, with colleagues here on campus to recruit students out of high school, transfer institutions. Uh, we had faculty and staff mentors come in, and we've been able to place these young men in academic cohorts specifically uh, in their first two years of college. And we have faculty who have been dedicated to teach these students. So in these classrooms, we're, we're noticing uh, some of the challenges more directly that men of color, we all already know, face. Um, the faculty are able to pinpoint uh, you know, concerns and issues, um, and they be able to address it, but the concerns still remain. Because every group of students that we get in, every cohort that we get in, we continue to see uh, challenges or concerns that our young men face. Now, it's important to notice that from a faculty standpoint or staff standpoint, um, it's never the fault of the student. Because people come from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of situations and circumstances. Um, and they're, they're going to come in with uh, cultural challenges. They're going to come in with their cultural norms. And it is up to us, individuals who are in education, uh, to work around how we classroom manage. And these spaces, uh, these cohort spaces have given us this platform. We're able to go in and assess how we instruct. We're able to go in and assess how students receive information. Um, but we're also able to look at, from a social work standpoint, um, how students uh, have faced social injustices in their daily lives outside of the classroom. Because these are things that they also bring into the classroom environment. Um, so you may have a student who's facing uh, a true story. We had a young man uh, whose parents were getting a divorce. So he's an adult male in college. I've been around his family his entire life. They're getting a divorce. How does that impact him in the classroom? Maybe he's not turning in work. Maybe he's not showing up for class. And the general stereotype may be, as an African-American male student, he's lazy. He's not enthused about his education. He's not being supported. Well, if that professor uh, directly keens in on their uh, personal implicit bias, they may think that that's the issue. Whereas the young man on his end may say, well, I don't want to disclose this to my professor because this is an authority figure. Um, I don't feel comfortable saying this or they're going to think that I am lazy or looked out. So even just that stereotype of that thought amongst both persons, neither person may be racist or neither person may be evil in their intent, but it is just the way we were brought up, the way we were taught, the way we were conditioned in media, conversations, articles, journals, anything that we see. And both individuals then may not communicate in an appropriate way to support that particular student. So these are some things that, that we've noticed just in, in the courses that we see. Um, and we do want to work to try to you know, accommodate some of these areas, um, as well as uh, noticing students who may have mental health issues as well. Students who've gone through K-12 who uh, may not have been diagnosed with dyslexia or any form of, of a learning disability in high school, and now they come to college with that challenge. Um, and again, from a faculty standpoint, how do we uh, help the student navigate that uh, in the college space? Great. Thank you, Jerry. It seems like we're getting lots of questions, a lot of good questions throughout the group chat. So I think we'll start with the first one. Let's see here. And thank you all so much for your participation. Okay, so one question that we have is um, someone said that they currently work as an assistant superintendent in a, in a school district. Before that, they were um, a high school, middle school, and ES principal, or elementary school principal. And um, in that role, they found that they can have um, affect more. They can affect more change if we start with the leaders. So. Definitely, I feel like that touches upon um, a lot of the discussion that John and Jerry were having about how when it comes to addressing um, implicit bias, it really has to start with faculty, because faculty are the ones who are interacting with the students and ultimately the decision makers of that process. So we completely agree with that. Um, another person said that they're extremely interested in how to train principals and how to work on their implicit bias and then put it into action as it relates to discipline, assigning disciplinary consequences. Um, do you two have any thoughts on how that person could go about that process? Yeah, definitely. Again, when we talk about working in K-12 spaces, 
we often know in most instances when we talk about discipline, that unless you know, we talk about the eligibility rule, it generally relates to men of color. Um, how do we identify these young men in as early as elementary school, as early as early childhood, where discipline forms begin to pile up? And once they got to middle school or high school age and they're an adolescent or a young man, in most cases, um, they are less reluctant to appeal to authority because they've been in this constant cycle of being removed from the classroom, uh, considered disruptive, at risk. All the terms that we use as professionals in our language, these terms have been uh, branded on these young men and they know it and they hear it in language and conversation and pass it the hallway. So a principal is definitely the change agent at a school. Uh, so how does the principal number one become more equipped? And how does the principal utilize the skills that they gain to move throughout their, their school to support their, their faculty, uh, their instructors, uh, and the assistant principals to be able to help that? Uh, and in certain instances, it could be, again, recognizing uh, the stereotypes that exist, recognizing the demographics and the culture of the community that you're in, um, the history of that community, um, as well as seeking out additional resources within the district district has resources to support, whether resources on financial or personnel resources. Um, if there are teacher training and preparation days uh, that can be brought in to uh, kind of talk around these issues. Uh, but definitely the principal uh, has to take a personal action uh, or personal reflection to start to work through these because uh, discipline um, later on could turn into criminal justice issues when these uh, students become adults, right? And that's definitely what we're trying to um, this fail the school is really pipeline. I'm gonna stop there and let you come in. <laughs> uh, I agree. Uh, there's lots of research on this, on uh, discipline and especially suspension and how it, it strongly relates to people not graduating from high school and people being involved with the criminal justice system. So I think it's, it's a really important issue to look at. And I agree that leadership of schools needs to look at this issue, but I think a lot of what makes the difference in people's lives is behavior in the classroom. So I think leadership can look at it from a systemic way in their own behavior. They can look at discipline. I think it'd be important to look at how discipline happens by race and gender in classrooms, but I think it's up to the classroom teacher to also look at their own implicit bias and address that. Uh, there's enough research to show that it can happen in every interaction in the classroom. So, uh, and the other thing I guess I want to say is there, there been a lot of research on implicit bias. There's also a lot of research on interventions that work to reduce implicit bias. And without, oh, we have time to get the, as much detail on the intervention, but we're going to use an intervention in our implicit bias center that's one of the few that has a lot of empirical support behind it. Uh, we're hoping to bring in the creator of the intervention as a consultant, but it's really about, they look at it as uh, you know, we talked about it like a schema early in, the, in this webinar, and it's looking at the schema becomes a habit of how you think. The intervention is how do you break that habit. And it's a lot of what Dr. Wallace talked about. It's, it's finding ways to refute the, the schemas and stereotypes you have in your head about a different race or a different gender. Thank you so much for your answers. We're scrolling down the group chat just to see what that next question will be. Okay. So the next question is from um, Jennifer Vieta. Jennifer Let's see, she noticed that in police departments and district attorney offices that look at diversity in terms of gender and race, but these crime and justice um, agencies are typically not diverse in terms of having subject matter professionals who are not lawyers or police officers. They tend to fill these positions with attorneys or police officers, includes business processes, human resources, and victim services. So, do you all have any thoughts in regards to when it comes to probably the lack of diversity when it comes to just the crime and justice services that we tend to see um, when it comes to the school to prison pipeline and how that may affect 
you know, the type of work that we're all trying to go about and changing and addressing the school to prison pipeline. Uh, first, I want to say in the College of Public Service, we're big fans of Jennifer, so thank you for the question, because uh, she's doing amazing work in the community. Uh, I think, I think you bring up a great point. Like a lot of the examples that when we talk about implicit bias are from the criminal justice system. And just to name a few, uh, there's a lot of research on how sentencing differs by not only race, but skin tone. So the darker the person, the longer the sentence. There's a lot of research on that. Uh, and uh, I think one of, the re one of the things we want to do with the center is train different people who may not be exposed to these issues, like someone who's a social worker or, or hopefully education or psychologist, but train other people who are CJ professionals in their training. We have a criminal justice undergraduate and masters. So we, want to, we really want to include this in people who typically don't get this training, that they're, they're really exposed to implicit bias, but not only exposed to it, but look, uh, given opportunities to look at their own implicit bias. Uh, so even if they're not, there's, I'd love to see more diversity uh, in professions, in gender and race. I think those are really important things in criminal justice systems. And I'd also love to see diversity of training that those people get. Yeah, to echo that and to follow up on the question as it relates to diversity of terms, not only being gender and race, but also reflecting of experience. Um, you know, depending on where, what communities you come from, we all bring a different uh, subset of skills. Um, you may have uh, two African-American men, same height, same stature, uh, same ability academically with the same academic credential and degree, but depending on how they grew up, depending on what neighborhood they came from, maybe they had both parents in the, in the home, uh, maybe one came from a single parent household, maybe he was a foster kid, maybe he participated in the military, maybe he was a sports guy. There are so many different dynamics that may impact those individuals, but just because those two persons share a similar characteristic or a similar demographic gender, um, it does not necessarily mean they may be the most equipped person to serve in these spaces. Um, it all goes down to personal reflection, uh, because as a, as a black male myself, I may have implicit bias, I have implicit bias, as we all do, um, on particular issues and circumstances. How do we have an important dialogue around these in spaces where it becomes uh, a direct issue? It can become a direct issue or a decision can be made that will really hinder how someone will grow and develop. And in most cases, as, as Dean Schwartz highlighted earlier, um, you see it in the criminal justice spaces. Uh, but again, going back to the classroom, when we talk about situations that happen in criminal justice spaces, we're actually talking about the end result. What actually happens as uh, people move through in academia? When you have children who are, again, adolescents or, or you know, young kids uh, in the K-12 system as they move through, um, you don't really get to the criminal system uh, essentially until you're you know, roughly at adult age. So how do we begin to impact direct interventions in the classroom, um, which means here in the college spaces, how do we equip our, our potential teachers to know these things and how do we work with um, those who would eventually become maybe law enforcement agents or, or lawyers or attorneys. Uh, I want to highlight again, just UHD, the demographic of our institution. We have a majority of students of color at our institution, specifically in our college. So we hope uh, greatly as well that we are producing uh, a workforce that can go uh, into our society, into our communities, and be able to change uh, some of these directions. But just because there are people of color, does not necessarily mean that they don't have implicit bias or won't contribute to the issues. So again, it's not just for white or black or Hispanic or, or brown to go through these issues. It is for everybody to go through. So that it's important that we all recognize our own challenges. Yeah, great point. Okay, those are um, all the questions that we have from the group chat right now, so definitely keep them coming. Um, I do have two additional questions for you all, just based off of the discussion that we were having earlier. So um, coming from a corporate America, America background, change is hard, 
And I know that you all mentioned when it comes to the process of moving forward with implicit bias and to how it is going to start with um, working with faculty and having them address their own biases. So how do you all plan to communicate with faculty in regards to this change that is coming? And then how do you all plan to motivate them to be able to take that step in addressing their own implicit um, biases and move forward with the work that the center plans to do? Uh, so, I think a lot of what you do when, uh, as dean and assistant dean of the College of Public Service, is you want to be mission driven, and so we've really worked uh, to get people to buy into what our mission is. So we're working uh, just a little bit about UHD. If people aren't familiar, is uh, the median income, family income of our students is thirty three thousand a year. We mentioned we're a very diverse institution. 78% of our record freshman class are first generation college students. So this is, a, a, I think, a real strength that we bring. And I think people who want to work at UHD are committed to that mission. And you can't be committed to that mission if you're letting things like implicit bias prejudice you against people. So, uh, so we're not saying there won't be just people who don't want to participate in this or who are resistant or defensive in their own way about looking at their own implicit bias. And we all have that. Uh, but it's part of the mission of why we're here and what we want to do. We really want to help people find careers that change lives as an institution. And this is part of that work to us. Do you have anything that you would like to add, Jerry? Well, again, just to piggyback on the thought around, you know, equipping already uh, great faculty with additional resources. Um, when you have a mission or when you have a strategic plan of how um, to move a college forward, it also impact, impacts the university, but it also impacts the community at large. Your faculty may only have a classroom of 22 to 25 students, but those 22 to 25 students are going to impact the outcome, right? So when you, when you talk to those faculty and you bring in their own expertise in the areas where they're strong in, when you give them uh, opportunities to, to reflect on that, it gives them confidence to begin to address uh, personal challenges that we all have, um, creating safe spaces to have dialogue. And we understand that dialogue also creates confrontation. Sometimes we have to do that um, in order to make change. I mean, uh, you know, when you get a scar and you put a Band-Aid on it and you get ready to pull the Band-Aid off, it hurts, right? But underneath the band-aid, the skin has healed. Um, so we have to pull some band-aids off. Um, it's gonna hurt. Uh, but again, when you work in this college, when you talk about public service and when you talk about the mission, um, you have to want to be here. And we believe that individuals who get on board want to be here. We believe that we all work at this institution uh, directly to change and support the areas of our community and to equip people uh, to just you know uh, be great supporters of everyone. Um, you know, we all come to this, to our jobs every day, uh, not for ourselves, but in the area of service. Uh, we are public service, so. Uh, Definitely, that's a great point. And it just makes me think a lot about how when it came to the process of bringing you all together as work group participants for your first work group, we asked you all, what is your why? What is that one short word or that phrase that is bringing you to address this type of work today? So it really all comes down to just staying true to that mission and staying true to your why and how we ultimately are all public servants when it comes to addressing this work. The next question I have for you all is that what challenges do you all see that can possibly affect the um, plans that you all that you all have for the implicit bias center and how do you all plan to overcome those challenges? All right. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, I mean, one of the challenges, the first challenge is, is doing the work ourselves. I mean, that's a challenge is, is making sure that we have looked, examined our own biases and that, that we're focused on how to create change. Uh, the, the other challenge is how to do this in a way that is truly impactful and sustainable. So just not to get into details, but funding is always an issue for that. We really want to create a center that brings in experts that people can do research in, that can serve community organizations. So we'd like if the constable's office says we want to look at implicit bias in, within our organization, we can provide that service. So that's our ultimate goal. And to do that, we really need to build 
a financially secure center that can do that kind of work. So those, those to me are the big challenges. And then to be on top of the cutting edge research, like this is a relatively new research area. Right. And uh, when you talk about kind of the research and all these things, this is relatively new. And neuroscience has done a ton in the last 10 years mm -hmm. on implicit bias. And how can we as researchers and professionals stay on top of the cutting edge and how to make change in this area? These things take time. Time is is can also be a barrier um, because you know sometimes you have ideas that you want to be able to move um, quickly, fast forward ahead. Um, but you have to strategize. You have to plan. You have to make sure that the correct team is assembled. Um, you also have to get individuals in the room of different uh, backgrounds and personalities, not even just uh, from a gender or ethnicity standpoint, but a difference of thought, a difference of perspective because uh, they all help to make and shape uh, what the center will be and what it will become. Uh, because again, at the end of the day, if we are to be a resource for not only the institution, uh, but various agencies and organizations, we're also, you know, want ISDs to come uh, to reflect, to say, hey, you guys are equipping students to come and work for us. We want to be a resource. We want to be a hiring mark to where people come to our institution and our college and say, hey, we want those students. We want students on the front end who are in our local ISDs to say, hey, I had a teacher that went to UHD who graduated from your College of Public Service School. I want to come and continue to be a gang and go gangers, bite, 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 had the hashtag that. Um, <laughs> uh, to come in and, and go and earn a degree at your institution. So as we do these things and we outline these things, it impacts enrollment, it impacts retention, recruitment. Um, so it's all connected. It, it, it all moves forward. Um, so, but those are challenges that you that you have to see through. Some of the things you won't know until it happens. But when you assemble a team uh, with individuals of diverse thought, um, you know, the more minds you're there, the more heads you have, um, the more opportunities you can have to change the thing. Another question that we have is that we have a not us then who we, we talk about Houston specifically being one of the most diverse cities in the country one of the fastest growing cities in the country um, but we also talk about how we're going to equip individuals to go out in our economy and be bankers right how are we going to uh, create more sustainable families to increase uh, income levels of those who they have been traditionally in low socioeconomic communities. Um, how do we provide more resources? Well, it has to go back to a personal uh, thought of who I am. Um, you know, having seen the areas where I've lived, I uh, was born and raised in Huntsville, Texas. Um, I moved to Conroe area when I got to high school. Then I saw the different levels of income. Um, I saw the, the opportunities of being in a rural community and then growing up in a suburban community. I saw the difference of the levels of education um, and how education incre increased wealth uh, for different uh, persons of different groups. Um, and as I navigated through, through college and through school, um, I saw personally uh, people who um, may have not taken advantage of certain resources or who did, were not exposed to certain resources, how they continue uh, the generational cycle of low income, poverty, or the various X, Y, Zs that go with that. Um, and if we are going to prepare a stronger Houston uh, to support a bigger state, um, the time is now. I mean, we, we talked enough, right? We, we have great leaders who, who come from Houston and they've done great work, uh, but if anybody is going to do it, um, I take it personal uh, in my respect to connect with uh, the city of Houston and various others who share this, share this, this, this passion um, I know there are going to be some days where uh, we're going to be tired. There are going to be some days where we're not going to eat lunch. Uh, 
And uh, but it's worth the effort for me because I have a young son and I want to create a space for him to where uh, he can walk into any room uh, and be not judged. And I'm not going to quote MLK right now, but you all know uh, what he said. Uh, but not just for him particularly, but for every student. A man, woman, boy, girl, uh, east, north, west side, south side, doesn't matter where you come from. Um, everybody wants to live and have a pursuit of happiness, as we might say. So uh, if, if not me, then who? Thank you for sharing that. How about for you, John? It's similar. Like, I want to, I think what, why we work so hard, get up early in the morning, and you know, excited to come to work is you want to make a positive difference in the world. That's why we're doing these jobs. Uh, and, and so this is an opportunity to really create change. And, uh, and I think about, too, my family and how you create change to make it a better world. that we got a question from the group chat. So we have um, Hakenia Jackson, I apologize if I said your name wrong. Um, studies show that bias or diversity training alone doesn't make a huge impact. Will you, will you all implement a performance metric that will ensure the program is sustainable? Yes, you want me to yeah, answer that? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So there's, we're using an intervention uh, that's pretty new that is showing some long-term, that's been the criticism of a lot of training. A lot of training, uh, not, I'm trying not to say it's in a critical way, but a lot of training is very short and focused on awareness and education, not on creating lasting change. So there's some real promise. This intervention has been replicated a couple times and has created long-term change. But to me, kind of your thing is, does it really change behavior over time? And that's really what we're trying to focus on is when we see, so we want to have people, when we're talking about training student teachers, we want to look at bias, not only in self-report and on implicit bias measures, but actual behavior in the classroom. So we're going to do that in a mock classroom. We, we're going to do it when there's student teaching through looking at actual ratings of behavior, and then we're going to do it when they're actually out teaching. So we hope to look at not only does it change people's implicit bias schemas, but does it change behavior over time? And that to me is the promise of, like we've been talking about an implicit bias center and we've been calling it internally equity in action because to us, the big part of it is, can we see actual behavior change? And we train in student teaching about 175 teachers a year. So if you, if you can think of the impact, like Jerry was saying earlier, the impact on all the people they see in the classroom, you can really create a system of change. Anything that you want to add, Jerry? Okay. Awesome. Well, it sounds like that you all have a very intentional approach, and it's all based on behavioral change, which is key, as we've learned when it comes to implicit bias. And, um, yeah, I think that may be all the questions that we've had from the group chat. Thank you all so much for your participation and your engagement. We look forward to continuing to engage with Dr. Jerry Wallace and Dr. Jonathan Schwartz. And we hope that this session was very informational and helpful for you all as we continue to move forward with our work groups when it comes to addressing implicit bias for school districts and reforms. So we hope you all have a wonderful weekend and have an amazing holiday. And thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye.